So this is on page 37 of your unit handout. As I've already explained, we're looking at launching objects horizontally. Remember from yesterday that when you have an object that is moving, or in this case, trying to move in a particular direction, but it's experiencing some other influence. So a boat is trying to head north, but the water is pushing it west. Or a plane is trying to fly east, but the wind is pushing it north. Remember that in those situations, each component of the motion acts independent of the other. So if a boat has an engine speed of 10 meters per second and it's attempting to cross a river that's 100 meters wide, it's going to take 10 seconds. 10 meters per second traveling 100 meters would be 10 seconds. It does that motion in that direction independent of what the river's doing. If the river's flowing east or west or whatever direction, it doesn't matter. And again, I went through this at the beginning, but I'd like to go through it again. If I have a boat that is trying to head north at four meters per second, but it's being influenced by a river that's flowing west at three meters per second, you use the Pythagorean theorem and get five meters per second. Everybody knows how to do that, right? Whatever that angle is, by the way, that's not relevant to my conversation with you right now. I'm not worried about that. There's a particular direction. We don't care about that. That's not my point. The fact of the matter is, every second the boat is in the water, it will be four meters closer to the other shore. And every second it's in the water, it's going to be three meters further downstream. This statement here would be true if the river wasn't flowing. It would be true if the river was flowing at 4 or 5 or 6 or 10 meters per second because these two things act independent of each other. So I hope you appreciate what the word independent means here. It means one doesn't affect the other. You with me on that? Okay. So again, visually I've shown this to you, but what this means is as time goes on, one second later, this is the position of the boat, another second later, another second, etc. And what's happening is that vertical motion is uniform motion of four meters per second. And the horizontal motion is uniform motion at three meters per second. So another way of saying that is regardless of how fast the river flows, if the engine speed is constant, the boat will move at that constant velocity in that north direction. I just want to make sure you know, when I say it will move at 4 meters per second north, I'm talking not about the fact that the boat will travel north, I'm talking about the distance increasing by 4 meters per second in a north direction. Because we know the boat travels at an angle, right? Okay. Regardless of what the pilot of the boat or the captain of the boat does, if the boat is pointing north, or it doesn't really matter, actually. Well, we'll say north. I guess it does. If the river is flowing at a particular speed, that's how fast the boat will move downstream. I feel as though you get the point. I've repeated myself enough times here on this. Okay. So horizontal and vertical components of motion are independent of each other. Now, there's a part to this lesson it, it's a warm-up that is going to try to change what we learned to what we're going to learn. It says we have a river that's 80 meters wide, and it's flowing east at 8 meters per second. A boat launches from the north shore from rest pointing south. And the boat accelerates from rest southward at 10 meters per second squared. Make a mental note that the acceleration due to gravity is about 10 meters per second squared. I will, in many of my analogies or explanations in this course, just say, let's call the acceleration due to gravity 10 meters per second squared, just to wrap our head around what's happening. And make a note that the boat is heading south, and that means if we take a look at the diagram, the acceleration is towards the bottom just like gravity is. I'm trying to draw a parallel between what's going on here and what's going to be going on with objects that are launched horizontally 
under the influence of gravity. It says complete the following table. I want you to notice that there is an error here. Uh, I'll give you a second to see if you can spot the error. The error is in one of the tables up here. And it's also in your handout. What is the error? Do you know? Which column is wrong? Right. This should say... Accelerated motion. Actually, we'll do it this way. It should say uniform acceleration. If we read the question carefully, the river is flowing east. The river is flowing east at 8 meters per second. That means that when we fill in the column that talks about east, we use uniform motion physics. We use speed equals distance over time. Or, if you like, rather than talking about speed equals distance over time, which is really we're talking about velocities, I guess you could say displacement is the velocity times the time. And we're going to use the velocity east to find the displacement east. Well, this is 8. Everywhere, this is 8. So after one second, it will have traveled 8 meters east. After 2, 16, 24. Are you with me on where I'm getting these numbers from? It's just 8 meters every second. So every second, we add 8 meters. 32, 40, 48. I want you to notice that 10 meters per second squared is a nice number to work with. If I start from rest, my initial velocity is nothing. And if I accelerate at 10 meters per second squared, acceleration of 10 meters per second squared means 10 meters per second per second. And that means after one second, the velocity will be 10 meters per second. After two, it will be 20 then 30, then 40, then 50, then 60. Now, we're playing a fantasy game here because those numbers are unrealistic for a boat in water. Okay, you're going to have other forces present, frictional forces. There's going to be all kinds of things that will cause the physics to break down. So we're thinking of in an ideal world. Okay? 60 meters per second is over 200 kilometers per hour. It's not realistic. What is the displacement? Well, we're going to have to do a bit of work here. Since for all of these times, we can trace it back to the beginning where VI was zero, we can calculate the displacement using one-half AT squared. So if I take one-half times 10 times 1 squared, I will get the displacement. And again, this is unrealistic. Forget about the actual width of the river or anything for the time being. What if I put in two seconds? I would have one-half times 10 times 2 squared. I think it's 20. But I want you to check for me. I'm not worried here about the reality of this being a possibility. We're learning something from this. What is happening to the distance traveled as time goes on? It increases. Why does it increase? Because the speed is greater. So we're not going to have the boat traveling in a straight line because it's uniformly moving in the east direction in terms of distance, which is called uniform motion, but it's accelerating in the south direction. So describe the path that the boat follows. Now, I'm just going to show this to you. You don't need to write any of this down. We'll, we'll write down the answer in just a second. Bless you. If this is the river, this image that you've got here that you're looking at is the, a snapshot in time at the moment you say go. The boat is not moving yet. It's about to start the rocket, the engine. 
And it's already in the water, though, so it's moving east. It's moving east at 8 meters per second. And this 8 meters per second is going to be a constant velocity east. It's going to be a constant velocity east because the river is not accelerating. But a short time later, whether you call it one second or a half a second or whatever, it will still be moving east at 8 meters per second, but it will have some vertical south component to its velocity. Yes? What's going to happen to Vx as we go on and look at other points in time? Nothing. It's going to stay at 8 meters per second to the right. What's going to happen to Vy? What's going to happen to Vy as time goes on? Look at your chart and look at the chart that's talking about velocity south. It's growing, isn't it? Why is it growing? Because there's an acceleration in that direction, which means, and it's very subtle. Do you see that my vertical component of the vector is a little bit more? And what's going to happen is that vertical component is con going to continue to increase. It's going to increase at 10 meters per second per second until it reaches the other side of the shore. So I want you to make a note, and this is already in your table, by the way, but we're talking about horizontal motion being uniform and vertical motion being uniform acceleration. Constant velocity, changing velocity. What do you think you call this shape? I, I don't know if any of you will know. You might, because you've taken Math 20. Do you know? It is a parabola. It's a special mathematical shape. This is called parabolic motion. And this is not just something, that, oh, of, by the way, this is interesting, this is what we call it. By the time you get to 30, we have to understand the difference between something called parabolic motion as opposed to circular motion. And the physics of them is entirely different. Parabolic motion of an object occurs when you have uniform motion in one direction and uniform acceleration in a perpendicular direction. Well, hang on a second here, and this is where we're going with this. If I were to stand on top of a ladder and throw a rock this way, it's going to follow the exact same laws of physics that we just looked at here. This is what horizontally launched projectiles will do. They will follow a parabolic curve where the horizontal motion is simply uniform at whatever that speed was to begin with, and the vertical motion is going to be defined by all of our kinematics equations. So describe the path that the boat actually follows. It's parabolic. How long does it take the boat to reach the south shore? Well, is the boat moving from the north shore to the south shore? Is that motion north to south uniform motion or uniform acceleration? Acceleration, right? Because it's accelerating at 10 meters per second squared there. We've learned that the motion south is independent of any motion east-west. So all we have to do is look at the fact that the initial velocity is zero. The acceleration is 10 meters per second squared. If we want to be pedantic about it, which means picky, I guess we should do this because south is negative. I'm doing it only because in a minute we're going to do problems with objects under the influence of gravity and we're going to use negative because gravity acts down. The displacement, well, how wide is the river? How far is it from the north shore to the south shore? It must say in the question. 80 meters. Sorry? 80 meters. 80 meters. Okay, so this is 80 meters. That means if we want to be, as I say, picky or pedantic, the displacement of the boat will be negative 80, although it doesn't really matter. 
We could just call everything positive here. And what you are trying to do is find the time. See, in the problems where the boat is not accelerating, the stuff we did over the past few days, you would just use speed equals distance over time. You'd use the speed south and the distance south to find the time south. But this is not uniform motion. So how do we do this? We can use d equals 1 half a t squared. Pretty simple calculation. In fact, everything we do today and tomorrow until the end of the unit is stuff you already knew how to do. Acceleration calculations or uniform motion calculations. You just have to decide whether it's one or the other. I'm going to rearrange this first this time. This is 2 times the displacement over the acceleration equals t squared. It's a pretty simple matter it's a pretty simple matter for us to take 2 times negative 80 and divide by negative 10. I hope you see that we didn't need to use negatives. They cancel. Uh, so 2 times negative 80 is negative 160 over negative 10 gives us 16. I've designed this so that the numbers we're getting are fairly reasonable for Time is not negative ever, so it's not plus or minus. The answer to this question is it takes four seconds. And everybody, at the risk of putting you to sleep by saying the same thing for the 20th time, it's going to take four seconds no matter what the river is doing. Whether the river is flowing at, I think it's 8 meters per second, or 10 meters per second, or whether it's still water and it's not moving at all. So this is my point here. The motion east is uniform motion because of that constant velocity, whereas what we're talking about for the south is that the speed is changing. How far downstream will the boat be? Well, it's not two boats. If it takes four seconds to cross the river, it's in the water for four seconds. And this is a question about east-west. Just help me out, Maxime. Is it 8 meters per second east? Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. So what happens here is it's uniform motion east, so we use this. But it's the same time. Whatever time it took to cross the river is the same as the time it takes to move downstream. So we can put in 8 meters per second here. It's a trivial calculation, actually. It's going to be 32 meters. I think 8 times 4 is 38, or 32. Two ball bearings are released at the same time from the same height, say 2 meters above the floor. One is dropped and the other is fired horizontally. We talked about this yesterday. The answer to this question is they reached the ground at the same time. I showed that to you as a demonstration. They both take the same time. You do not need to write down, I don't think, what I'm about to draw or explain. I think it's just a matter of you understanding it. If I have a ball bearing that is dropped from rest, then VIY is zero. It's not moving down at all. If I have an identical ball bearing, which is fired this way, say to the right at 4 meters per second, right, then VIY is 0. It's not moving down at the instant I fire it. Now, it turns out VIX is 4. Are you with me? This VI is like the boat traveling south, and the VX is the speed of the river. It doesn't matter what's happening to the second ball bearing in terms of it moving to the right. It will move down under the influence of gravity. 
And the influence of gravity for both of these is the same. 9.81 meters per second squared down. It doesn't matter what the river is doing to the boat, and it's not going to matter what this initial motion of 4 meters per second right is because gravity doesn't act right. Gravity acts down. All right, let's get into the examples now. A small toy car rolls off the edge of a table at 4 meters per second. The top of the table is 1.5 meters above the floor. Question is, where does the toy car strike the ground? So if we were to draw this, you've got this arc drawn here. What I am asking you to determine is this displacement of the car. Is that displacement of the car a vertical thing or is it a horizontal thing? It's a horizontal thing. When you set up these problems, what you need to always do, my advice, some of you will graduate to not having to do this, is to make a chart that talks about horizontal motion and vertical motion. This is uniform motion and this is uniform acceleration and your, your chart does not have to be as detailed or extensive as this I'm just doing this for the first one next time around I'll just put x and y and expect you to know that x is uniform motion y is uniform acceleration but here's the point Uniform motion is governed by one equation only. Velocity is displacement over time. That's it. That's the only formula you can apply in, the, in that column. Whereas uniform acceleration, wow, that's governed by a whole bunch of equations. All of those equations that relate VI, VF, A, D, and T. So let's put the information from the question into this table. How tall is the table? 1.5 meters? That means the displacement of the object is going to be negative 1.5. The displacement of the car from the beginning to when it hits the floor is negative. For all the questions today and probably tomorrow, we don't need to use negatives, but we will later, so let's use them now. Uh, well, we know the acceleration vertically, negative 9.81. We know VI here. What's VI? It's zero. Huh. If you look at the question, the question says four meters per second. And is that the initial velocity of the car? Yes, it is. But that's in a horizontal direction. There is no vertical component to 4 meters per second to the right. However, we can put 4 meters per second here. Thank you. It's under velocity. And I think if you scour this question for any other information, that's it. There's nothing else we've got. Would you agree? Okay. This is our goal. But when you look at the left-hand column, knowing the velocity of an object is not enough to find the displacement. We would need to know the time. So how are we going to find this time so that we can calculate the displacement? Ephraim, do you know? Um, 
Right. The, the idea is that this time, which is preventing us from finding the displacement, is the same as this time. So you have to do a uniform acceleration calculation to find the time, so you can use that time to find the horizontal displacement. And this is going to be the, the thing that we do all the time with these problems. You find the time in one to, fi to find something else in the other. And in this particular case, we're going to be using this formula a lot. You're going to use this formula. We've done this kind of calculation many times. I don't care about VF. It's not helpful. I'm trying to find the time. And that means you're going to take 2 times the 1.5 divided by the 9.81. If you want to use negatives, go ahead and use negatives. And then you have to take the square root. So 2 times 1.5 divided by 9.81. And I take the square root. The car is in the air for 0.553 seconds. Did anybody else get that number? Okay. So that number goes here. And we're just about done. These, these problems are not difficult. As long as you remember, you want to look at horizontal and vertical separately. So now I can take 4 meters per second and multiply it by 0 0.553 seconds. Point four four ish, no. Two point two one. Call it two point two meters. In physics, when we say digit, we don't mean significant digits. We don't mean decimals, we mean digits. Two two, that's two digits. So two point two. See if you can answer number two now. This is the standard way this is asked, and it's always on diploma exams, it's always on our unit exams, it's always on the unit exams in Physics 30. In order for you to determine the answer to the previous question, you had to use two physics principles. So you're looking at your formula sheet now. The question is, what two physics principles did you use, and in what order did you use them? Well, as soon as we use any form of this equation, well, I shouldn't say as soon as we use that, but we used this for the left-hand column, didn't we? Vectors or otherwise, I don't care. As soon as you do that, you are using this physics principle. You're using uniform motion. As soon as you use the concept of accelerated motion, whether we talk about A, V, I, V, F, all that stuff, as soon as you do that, you are talking about accelerated motion. That gets more complicated later in the course. But So what did we do first? It's not about what the car did. What calculation did we use first? We did an accelerated motion, right? So 1 followed by 0. 1 for accelerated motion, 0 for uniform motion. So this would be the answer to this question. And on every exam, from now on till the end of your high school physics career, you will have a numerical response. I call them a combination question, a two-punch combination. You're going to have to apply two physics principles to get an answer, and you will always be asked this question. And today, it's always going to be 1, 0, or 0, 1. Okay, let's try another one. A stunt person drives off of a cliff that is 75 meters above the water below. The driver lands 132 meters from the base of the cliff. This time, I'm asking, if I asked you to determine the speed of the car at the beginning what two physics principles would be used. I put it in this order because I've seen on diploma exams them do this. I don't think you can really answer this question until you answer the actual question. 
I think you need to go through the motions and find out what it is you do. So how do we do this? You set up your table for X. You set up your table for Y. Well, I think with a little bit of thought, everybody is capable of understanding that VF is not relevant to anything going on in these questions. We're not asked to find how quickly the car moves downward at the end. So I'm just leaving it out. What is VI? Zero. Under the Y column. What is this V? It's what we're trying to find. We're trying to find the true initial velocity of the car, which is how fast it goes off of the cliff. If you're looking for a diagram, here's the water, here's the cliff, here's the car. That's the diagram. At the beginning, there is a velocity in this direction that velocity is going to still be the same in that direction all the time, but it's going to grow vertically, so it's going to change direction. And this is, what, what are the distances? 75 and 132. So let's put in as much information as we can. Negative 9.81, negative 75, 132. I think we can answer question three now, because if we're trying to determine the highlighted thing, we're missing the time, which means we have to find the time over here, just like the previous question. And then instead of finding the displacement, we can find the velocity. So you're going to be doing physics principle one followed by zero here. So we can answer that. And now we can do the calculations, which are really simple. Like, seriously, you guys, finding the time from these things is, at this point, child's play in this course. Then it becomes a uniform motion, a, a junior high science question about speed, distance, and time. Uh, the time will be equal to the square root of 2d over a. We do this calculation so often that you just know it. So I'm going to take 2 times the 75 divided by the acceleration. Now I've left the negatives out because they don't matter because they're going to cancel. There's other ways to look at it. I take the square root. <laughs> so it's a long time to be in a car flying through the air, plummeting towards the ocean. It's almost four seconds. Four seconds may not seem long under certain circumstances, but that would be a little bit of a terrifying ride. So it's 3.91 seconds. We can put that here. because the time it takes to move the 132 meters to the right is the same as the time it takes to move the 75 meters to the bottom. Now we go over here, we calculate the speed, 132 by 100 kilometers per hour by my count. So 33.7 meters per second is the answer to the question. Um, three digit answer, so we're going to go 37, 33.8, I guess. This is why I don't care about significant figures. In numerical response questions, you'll always be told how many digits. 
Three is a digit, three is a digit, eight is a digit. Any questions with three or four? Let's keep going. A ball rolls off of a tabletop that is 175 centimeters above the floor. How long does it take the ball to reach the floor if it was moving at one meter per second when it left the tabletop? What does this look like in terms of a, speaking of tables, a, a horizontal and a vertical table? Well, VI is zero. A is negative 9.81. D is negative 1.75. Can you calculate the time from this? Well then, who cares what this is? This goes back to the beginning, that they're going to hit the ground, those balls that we talked about at the beginning, those spheres are going to hit the ground at the same time, whether it's moving across the countertop at 1 or 2 or 10 meters per second, or whether it's just dropped. And finding the time from these we're in candy stealing territory, right? Go ahead and do that for me. I'll do the same thing here. Bless you. You're getting about point six zero seconds. That's the answer to this question. What's the answer to B? Same time. Exactly. Because the vertical motion is independent of the horizontal. Since gravity acts down and we know the vertical distance, we can find the time it's in the air, regardless of what it's doing horizontally. So for both of these, well, I'll put 0.597 seconds. Based on the information in the question, we should probably round to 0.60, but um, I don't care. <laughs>